master bedroom. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, when I came around to the other side of the bed so I could assess the child, she uh, continued to do mouth to mouth and, and compress his chest. She didn't push mouth. away and let you, the medical professional, take over and, and she kept doing it herself? Right. I, as I came over to assess him, I tried to get in and look at him and I couldn't get near his face or his upper body to assess him. Her hair was in the way because she leaned over him as she did her mouth to mouth. And I said, excuse me. And, and she continued to do it and say, come on, baby, breathe. And I finally, I had to use my arm and forcefully just kind of move her off to the side so that I could get in. And what struck me odd at that time was the second she moved and I was right there to assess him, the child was already breathing and had a pulse at that time. Uh, so, therefore, he, he didn't need the CPR at that point. How, how did she seem to react, Tony, to your presence and to the fact that uh, somebody had come to assist her? Uh, as far as her reaction, uh, if it was my son, I would be totally hysterical. And once I was in there, she began to talk with the officer once I took over. She stood there for about a few seconds and then was starting to talk to the officer as I was working on the child. Did, did you respond to calls with some frequency to her home? Oh, yeah. We, uh, I think we had, I don't know, seven or eight times we uh, responded to her home. So because of that, did you begin to form an opinion about what may have been going on? Well, I didn't really form an opinion at first. I thought it was odd what had happened on the first call, but then you just kind of let it slide. Um, she said she was a nurse, so I thought that could explain some of her calmness, you know, being medically knowledgeable. Uh, however, we keep a log book, and we, start, we keep track of all our calls and so forth. It's kind of an informal log book on our desk, and we started to notice a pattern that these were happening on Tuesdays and Fridays. But it sounds like she's starting to treat this more like a social visit, Greg, than she is a real emergency phone call. Right. So, several of the paramedics and the police that were there said it was like a social event, you know, like, oh, hi, Tonya, how you doing? You know, the baby's okay now, you know, which hospital do you want to go to? And she would brighten up, you know, click up her little heels and head on over. And somebody but, said she was even as good at doing CPR as she was at baking a cake. She acted like it was no yeah, big deal. It was casual and calm. Yeah. And then, but the nurses also noticed some rather bizarre elements in the relationship between Tanya and her son. Describe those for us. Yeah, neighbors and the nurses noticed that the little boy who was about two did not want to be left alone with his, with his mother. Whenever the mother approached, the little boy would rear up and, you know, scream and, and not really vocalize because he didn't talk. Mm -hmm. Even though he was two years old, he did not speak. And the, uh, the neighbors saw this too. Whenever Tanya would come to pick up her children, she had another daughter at the time, the little boy would run away, hide from mommy. And antagonistic toward each other at the hospital too. And, and Tanya too, on Tanya's side too. Tanya was very frustrated with her child. She would smack her fist on the hospital bed if the child was acting up, she, you know, where a lot of the parents would be, you know, try to console a child. Mm -hmm. Tanya was frustrated and bothered by that kind of behavior. Mm -hmm. Tony said he was beginning to make notes. I imagine others were, too. Maybe, maybe the doctors, maybe police. What, was, what were the first suspicions or who was suspicious really? first? I would say Tony really? and his group. If you read his logbook, they, they don't really know what they're seeing, but their mm -hmm. notes are very revealing. They're saying it's... You know, Tony went out at 5.30 last night. Guess where? Saw the little Reed boy. Oh. You know, the other note would say, you know, it's 5.30 on Wednesday. Guess where we're going? You know, they, they knew. Something they knew was something up. was very strange. They didn't know exactly what they had. And as police delved deeper into the relationships between this mom and her kids, they discovered more than just child abuse. They discovered an act of murder. The story continues when we come back right after this break. Judy has worried about what she eats her whole life, but on Wednesday she'll meet a doctor who says eating fat doesn't make you fat. He'll reveal to her the secrets on how to balance her body, secrets to losing weight without losing your mind and your money, Wednesday. Why would a mother repeatedly harm and in one case actually murder her own child? Local author Greg Olson is here to tell us a true, very, very shocking true story. And we have a phone call on the line. Go ahead. You're on the air. Uh, yeah, I'm just wondering, where was the husband or relatives or friends and all this was going on? Good, good question. Yeah, the husband at the time in Iowa, he was working nights. He did have a management job, but he was working a later shift. 
and uh, Tanya was isolated from her family because she had moved to another state. She was no longer in Texas. And she had a hard time making friends, so she really didn't have any friends either. And, and was, nobody was there to witness these episodes that the children were having, according to Tanya? Well, Tanya did say her mother witnessed one, and her, a doctor had witnessed one, but that didn't pan out. Hmm. No, they, they witnessed it later. They didn't witness the onset of right. what she called a seizure. that's the critical thing. She was the only one there when it happened. On the phone with us now is Melody Haynes the, from Des Moines, Iowa. She's the prosecutor who dug her teeth into this case and, and wouldn't let go until... She put Tanya behind bars. You, you got the autopsy report on nine-month-old Morgan, right? This was, yes. this was Tanya's child who had died early on. What did that report reveal? Well, uh, we looked at the report, and first of all, at the bottom, it said no evidence of child abuse, which is quite frankly a little bit unusual mm -hmm. uh, just to be stated so blatantly in a report like that. And then we looked at the findings, and there was a finding of blood on the brain of this baby. So we took it to our state medical examiner, Dr. Tom Bennett, um, who is truly an expert at child abuse. And he told us quite candidly it was a homicide. Most of our viewers, Melody, like you at the time, probably have never heard the term Munchausen syndrome by, by proxy. We'll talk about it more later in the show, but was this a first for you to hear about this? <laughs> yes. I thought they were making the word up when I heard it the first time. Mm -hmm. So what was actually happening to this little girl? If you say there was stuff on the, there was blood on the brain, was she being abused, hit in the head, or what was happening to her? She was an abused child. Uh, what happened is we had Dr. Bennett look at the entire autopsy report and the microscopic findings, and his conclusion was that Morgan Reed suffered from uh, what is recognized as shaken baby syndrome. She had been shaken so hard and so violently, it caused her little brain to bleed. We're looking at some video of, of Morgan Reed in her little yellow suit as a baby. She only lived to be nine months old. Was there ever any proof that she was more than shaken, that the mother had suffocated her? Well, Morgan had had 21 of these apnea episodes herself, like Robert had had. And so when, when we got the autopsy report and Dr. Bennett said that this is child abuse, we subpoenaed all of her records as well and discovered that she had had identical episodes to um, her brother where she'd be alone with the mother, quit breathing, and, and Tanya would have to resuscitate her. Mm -hmm. So to, to you at this point, Melody, and probably to your colleagues, this was beginning to sound doubly suspicious. Mm-hmm. There's, a, there's an audio tape where uh, Tanya was chatting actually with, with Greg Olson and listen to her response uh, when she was asked to talk about being accused of abusing her little son, Michael. And, uh, and then call me to tell you the investigators are here to want to talk to us. And I just, I don't know, totally devastated me. I thought, oh. And then I got me, I thought, what in the head do they think they're, I didn't say heck, but, you know. What do they think they're doing? I like our kid here. We are trying to help him, and they're accusing us of everything else. Mm -hmm. And they're mad, they're hurt. Um, but we thought we want to cooperate, be nice, and we're going to hide, we're going to do everything we can. Mm -hmm. For those like me who had trouble understanding her, Greg, uh, she, decipher she, for us what she, she said. She was devastated. She said, how could they accuse me? I love my children. How could anyone say that I would ever hurt my, my, my son or my daughter? She we, said she was flat out shocked. And the family believed her. The, I talked to her mother today, and we talked to her sister today. They stand by her side no matter what? To the bitter end. Were they a little suspicious? No, I mean, they wanted, they would like this to be resolved in some way. They want this over, but right. they will never think that Tanya could ever have done this. So the family, though they were never there, this includes her husband, mm -hmm. had taken Tanya's word for it when it came to little Morgan, too, mm -hmm. that right. these were episodes of sleep apnea or, or the cessation of breathing. Right. Mm -hmm. And that little Morgan eventually, after 20 of these episodes, died of SIDS. Right. And what happened, what Melody was referring to on that autopsy report, it said it was a SIDS death. SIDS is a diagnosis made when there is no other explanation for the death, and yet this child had been hospitalized 39 days in, its, in nine months of its life. Mm -hmm. There was no way that was a well child. Mm -hmm. Regardless of what was happening to the child, it was not a SIDS death. How did you, Melody, finally get the little boy, Michael, out of the house if you were afraid that she was going ab abusing this other child as well? Well, actually, we, re we removed the little boy before we found out about Morgan. Uh, 
Mm. And our juvenile court authorities just felt that it was so coincidental time after time that she was alone and resuscitating the child. I think we had about nine events in Iowa. And the last time, there was already a child protective investigation going on. She knew that because she had been investigated, and she was told there was an investigation. Mm -hmm. The last hospitalization, she chose a different hospital than she had been to before. She'd always gone to the same children's hospital before. And this time, the final episode, she admitted him under a different name. Oh, my. Ooh. And what would she say about the doctors? I found this interesting when she would go in. She thought the doctors were out to get her, didn't she? That they were falsely accusing her. Oh, yes. She thought they had a vendetta or something against her, which was a little the unusual. The world had a vendetta. Uh -huh. You mm -hmm. know, she's one of those people. Everybody's wrong, and I'm the only one that's right. Right. Up next, you will hear another dark secret from Tanya's past and hear how it finally put her in jail. And you will also hear from a neighbor who babysat for Tanya's children. What did she see? Well, you'll find out right after this break. People thought uh, of Tanya Reed as the woman who tried too hard to fit in, and no matter how hard she tried to be an insider, she was always an outsider with her neighbors. And on the phone is one of those former neighbors, Stacy Mullins. Stacy, tell us about the first time you met Tanya. Do you remember that first meeting? Uh, kind of. I, I believe it was our girls were outside playing, and they they became friends. Is that that? how it all began and she came outside and I came out and that's how we first met. Was she a little too open with you would you say when it came to relationship situations and sexual stories when it dealt with her husband? Uh, yes I did feel that way she was very very talkative I really never got a chance to say too much about me or mm -hmm. my children it was mostly about her and her life and where she had just moved from and um, offered right away to be a babysitter for me if I, you know, needed to get out or... But then didn't or... she just take advantage of you before you even got a chance to babysit? <laughs> uh, you babysat for her before she even got a chance to babysit for you? To be real honest with you, um, I never did ask her to watch my daughter because I, well, I just had that feeling that I just didn't want to ask her to babysit for me. Tell, tell me what you observed, Stacy, as far as the relationship between Tanya and her son, Michael. Well, whenever Michael and uh, Tanya would be together, he would usually be very upset. He mm -hmm. would usually be very hyper. He'd be screaming. He'd be crying. He would never talk. And by, um, con and by contrast, how was he when he was with you and Tanya was not around? He was uh, quiet and giggly and fun, and he played. He loved my daughter. He would say my daughter's name, and he would try to say my name. I would swear, you know, he's, mm. he's saying my name. Um, and he would kind of jabber around. But that's that's pretty that, telltale, though, isn't it? That speaks volumes about what was going on with this child. What, what about, did you ever see any scratches or bruises or, or anything on little Michael? No, I can't say that I did. Mm -hmm. But you saw a lot of these episodes, at least after the episodes, right? You saw the ambulance screaming up the street, and you'd end up taking care of her daughter, Carolyn, while Tanya would have to go with the ambulance to the hospital. What was her attitude like after each one of these so-called seizure attacks? Well, I guess the first time I, I got up there and I walked in, and she was kind of over Michael, and she was just real hyper, you know, and I, I, right behind me walked the, you know, came the ENT people, the mm -hmm. EMT, and I was very, I, I was just shaking, I, I was shaking all over, and uh, she was just very matter-of-factly, you know, uh, you, you take Carolyn and, and I'm going in the ambulance with Michael. But on some occasions, she actually drove her own car, didn't she, Stacey? Yes, because uh -huh, she wanted her car. Jim in our audience has a comment or a question. Jim? Where are you? Oh, there you are. Let's get a microphone to you first, Jim. Okay, go ahead. Was Tanya ever is she sick or anything, or is she just normal looking for attention? You want to handle that one? <laughs> she's not sick, and she's not normal. It's, a, it's that kind of a question. Mm -hmm. She 
she has a problem, but she's not mentally ill. Do you want to go into that a little bit? But well, why don't we take a, a commercial break okay. and then we'll go into that in a, in, in a little bit. But yeah, but let, talk about the pattern, if you will, first. I assume by this point there, there was enough evidence being put together by a number of different sources that a pattern was being observed. Right, and the pattern was all the episodes, with the exception of one, happened on a Tuesday or a Friday mm. between 5 o'clock and 6 o'clock at when, night. And Tanya's husband was always at work? He was always gone. Did the episodes occur while she was usually out of work? Yes, when she was unemployed, when she had right. nothing to do, or when she wasn't taking classes, that's when it would happen. There was an interesting situation, though, when it came to a deep, a deep secret from Tanya's past, and it dealt with Scott Simmons. It was sort of the smoking gun for the prosecutor. Right. And now Scott was who? She was 17 when right. she met Right, she was a Scott. high school student, and she was babysitting in her hometown of Dumas, Texas, down there in the panhandle. And Tanya says that she was uh, watching TV and the little boy stopped breathing. He was, uh, uh, I think he was nine months old or something like that. And Tanya had to summon medical help. That was uh, something the prosecutors, nobody knew about that and, and until very time, late in the game. At the time, she was thought to have been heroic. She got a plaque and she got her name in the paper and it was a big, big event in her life. So, how'd, how'd, so the ba how'd the baby come out? The baby does have, um, is fine. He's graduated from high school. He's going on to college, but he did have a, uh, some some problems after that some episode, which was the only episode mm -hmm. he ever had in his life, was when she was the babysitter. So why would Tanya intentionally cause her own children to suffer and possibly even another child from another family? How was she able to get away with it for so long? Some real startling revelations at about a bizarre emotional disorder after this break. Do you know someone who has a secret dream but has never had the money to make it come true? Maybe it's someone who needs a new start but just doesn't know where to begin. If you know anyone who needs a new lease on life, call us at 421 Live immediately following today's show. Welcome back. Robin in our audience has a question for author Greg Olson. Go ahead, Robin. When the, when the mother or the father would take the children in periodically for their exams, just their routine exams and immunizations, why couldn't they detect any kind of abuse? Because the abuse actually is, is what the, the, really what the medical people are doing to the child. That's the physical abuse. When they're taking the blood, when they're doing the tests and all that, they're looking for a cause for a problem that doesn't exist. These children had every test under the Everything sun, Everything you can imagine, ten times. Yeah. You know. So so how did she get away? What is this that we're talking about? Is this Munchausen? By, right, Munchausen syndrome by proxy. What, is, what does that mean? I know Munchausen is when you hurt yourself right. to get attention. And, and Munchausen syndrome by proxy is when the, usually it's the mother, although there are a couple of cases where it's the father, harms their children to get attention. And they get, they get attention through the medical community or sometimes it's maybe a distant spouse that they want to reel in a little closer. How could so, she lead this a so-called perfect life for so long and get away with doing this without anybody noticing. Because you're, you know, these Munchausen perpetrators, they switch doctors, which Tanya did. She would go to a different doctor here, a different hospital there. They're also seeing a lot of specialists. You know, when they're looking for some problem that doesn't exist, these doctors go deep. So they're going, you know, she's off to this clinic, to that clinic. There's no communication, really, mm -hmm. between one central individual, so they don't know. Shirley in the audience with a question. Go ahead, Shirley. Her childhood, was it troubled? What was her relationship with her parents? Yeah, actually, I, from the surface, it looks like a, a loving home. Um, she had a good relationship with her mother. Her father was a little more distant. He was also in the medical business, which a lot of Munchausen people are involved in the medical business even before they get to that point. But you wrote something interesting, actually, that when it comes to the family background, dealing with how Beverly Kay pampered Tanya a lot. The big sister, is, her right. name is Beverly Kay. You almost can see that Tanya was set up in uh -huh. some ways to, to have this sort of a problem in that she, her, her big sister said, Tanya was my little real live baby doll. You know, I used to take care of her and do this and that for her. Because her mother was always Her in mother the was ill hmm. quite a bit. Or Tanya's, Tanya's happiest memory, she tells me, or one of her earliest memories of her mother is when she said, I was in the hospital. I was three years old. My mom was there, as she was. And she said, I was there to get a cyst removed, and my, they took, wheeled me into my mother's room, and they put me in the bed with my mom. Mm -hmm. And she said, I felt so good, so safe. 
I'm so happy. Of, look at all the attention she got because right. her mother was in the hospital. But they find that attention related to medicine is, is where it begins. Mm. We'll take a phone call. Go ahead. You're on the air. Uh, yes, I was wondering what's going to happen with Tanya uh, and or her children in the future. Where, where is she now, Greg? You know, she her murder conviction was thrown out uh, recently. She was convicted of murder in Texas. Right. Convicted of child abuse of the son in Iowa. Right. Served five years, went on to Texas to face the murder charge of the daughter. That was thrown out on technicality. She's awaiting another trial. Or she's still in prison she's waiting She's still in this? prison. Yeah, and she, you know, she will either take a plea or she'll have another trial in the fall. So if, but if she's found guilty uh, in the second trial... The, the murder trial. Right. Uh, she will have already served her time, will she not, in Iowa? Yeah, that's over. So that'll be over. Right. She could be free. Right. And her kids, someone asked about her kids. They're healthy. There's been no problems with the little boy. From the day he was taken out of his mother's home, he was miraculously cured, you know? Yeah, I, I talked to the mom today, and she said he, he's doing quite fine, and they go to visit Tanya every weekend in prison. She takes him to go visit. In what percentage of these cases, Greg, if, if, you, if these statistics are available, do the children, like little Morgan, end up dying? They do say, you know, there's about a thousand cases a year, and 10% of those cases will end in death. So about 100 kids a year, and maybe I am, more. And I imagine, as, as we have just heard, it's very difficult to diagnose what is going on in these cases. She had a neurologist who testified in her behalf. And still stands with her and says that it's an unknown genetic neurological disorder that caused both children's problems. He hey. believes that's a possibility still. Melody, are you going to let her get out of prison? Uh, unfortunately, I have nothing to say about it. Oh. She has served her time in Iowa mm -hmm. and uh, now faces the, the Texas prosecution and, and hopefully the Texas jury will once again do what they, they've done before and find justice. Can, can you be called again, Melody, as a uh, witness for the prosecution? Yes. I can. I'm planning on it. Good. You are planning on doing it. Does it, does it hurt you to think that she, she might get out? Uh, unfortunately, in my business, you learn to live with that. It, it, yes, it's very frustrating, and, and particularly as a mother, I worry so much about if she ever has access to small children again. Valerie, thanks for talking to us today and for all you do in the interest of child abuse. And Greg Olson, great to have you back Thank on you. the program. Congratulations on the book. Thanks. We'll be right back. Greg Olson's latest book, Mockingbird, is now available at local bookstores. Planet Hollywood is breaking new ground, and you're invited. On June 30th, Sly Stallone and his celebrity friends are throwing a star-studded fundraiser to benefit the Seattle Symphony. Northwest Afternoon is going to give away two tickets to one lucky studio audience member this week. Just call 443-8333 for a chance to rub shoulders with the stars. This week, tomorrow, mm -hmm. we've got scoop on that love triangle from all my kids. Julia loves Noah, Noah's with Taylor, blah, 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 blah. Who's going to get together with whom? And... Which of the two women will sabotage the other's amorous attempts to get the man? With also, the dreadlocks. <laughs> also tomorrow, Glenn is going to tell us how his life was shattered in just a split second. In a crash that took place as he helplessly watched, his wife was killed because of a drunk driver who'd had four previous arrests on the same charge. Coming up will be, for many Americans, a long Fourth of July weekend. So the question is, will there be a drunk driver on the same street or on the same freeway where you are traveling? Could someone you know, someone you love, be killed by a drunk driver this weekend? Join us tomorrow as you talk about ways to curb drunk driving and stop these senseless deaths. Now let's see what the Coma 4 News team is working on for 5 o'clock. Here's Dan Lewis. Thank you, Dick. Good afternoon. President Clinton is coming to the Northwest tonight, and Como News 4 will have complete coverage for you. In fact, today I talked with the president one-on-one -on -one about his visit. At 5 o'clock, you can see what he has to say about the issues that matter to Northwest voters. Big news for Northwest shoppers today. Nordstrom has just inked a deal for a big new flagship store in downtown Seattle. We'll have details. Also on Como News 4... I thought I lost her. I mean, I just, I just am completely in awe that she made it a... His wife was run down by a hit-and-run boater on a local lake. Now police say they know who that boater is. The latest on this story at 5 o'clock. And it's that time of the year when allergies are making many people miserable. We'll show you a very unusual way to treat them in our report for your health on Como News 4 at 5 o'clock. Thanks, See Dan. you tomorrow, everyone. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Transportation for many of the guests on Northwest Afternoon. Provided by Magic Touch Limousine Service specializing in corporate accounts.